Okay, welcome back. It's time for lesson seven. We're doing some more statistical mechanics. Before we wrap up this block, um, we're going to start with ion traps. I'm going to do that ion trap demo I promised last time but never got around to. We're going to wrap up our discussion of the statistics of different types of particles. And in particular, we'll, um, we'll look at a couple of Monte Carlo demos that I cooked up to illustrate the behavior of fermions, bosons, and distinguishable particles. And finally, uh, probably in class today, we'll talk about how you generate random distributions of numbers of various types, not just uniform distributions, but other exponentials and cosines and sines and stuff like that. So that's what's online. Let's start with the demo of the ion trap. We already talked about this in the slides for last time, but let's, uh, let's see what they really look like. Okay, let's see if this works. Um, I want to run a little Python application that uh, simulates this ion trap. So what we have here are the four conductors. Two of them are positive and the other two are negative. Every half cycle, then they switch. These guys become positive, these guys become negative. This is the origin of the coordinate system. And that little yellow guy is my ion. So I'm going to start the time and I want you to notice that first thing you see is that the ion wiggles very quickly. That's the high frequency response to the alternating electric field, but that there's also a low frequency response, which is sort of the average uh, motion over many of the short or the high frequency cycles. Um, and you can see that the thing is bound to a region near the origin. It, uh, it feels a net restoring force back toward the axis of the system. And then there's also uh, an electric field a uh, convergent electric field along the longitudinal direction that keeps the thing confined in the in the z direction and uh, and you can see that it wiggles around. Now the thing I haven't explained is that if you apply a strong slightly detuned laser field that that produced that has the net effect of producing a damping force. It, uh, it causes a little bit of radiation pressure, which pushes the thing away from the origin a little bit, but it also causes a damping force. And uh, what I plan to do is to add little bits and pieces of the theory in every couple of lessons, so that by the end of the semester, we have a fairly complete picture of how uh, you can build an actual quantum computer using ions in one of these traps and they can communicate with one another and you can actually do calculations. So you can see the damping force is sort of causing the thing to die down now and uh, it's slowly approaching the origin and, uh, and that's how it works. Okay, now let's go back to discussing uh, different kinds of particles and the number of ways we can distribute them. So for distinguishable particles, the big Q here is the number of ways that you can distribute capital N distinguishable particles among a set of states where you have uh, little n can be any number from 1 to infinity and big N sub little n is the number of particles in that particular state, the little nth state, and d sub little n is the degeneracy of the little nth state. So that's the idea. Um, in the distinguishable case, you get this monstrosity. For fermions, it uh, looks still fairly monstrous, but the difference is you can't put more than d sub little n fermions into, any, uh, into the nth state, and so there's a limit, whereas for distinguishable particles, there's no such limit. For bosons, there's not a limit either, except that for bosons, uh, if you put five bosons in a... Uh, a level that can hold 10, then it turns out there's a, there's only so many ways you can do it, but th the uh, you can't count, there aren't as many states there as there are for distinguishable particles, because if you've got um, 311, for example, that's the same as 113 or 131 and so on, because you can't tell which particles in in which state exactly. That's kind of the idea. Anyway, there are fewer bosonic states available than there are for distinguishable particles because you can't, they don't have labels. So putting three bosons, there's only one way to put three bosons in one state. 
right? You can't, their, their order doesn't matter because the order doesn't make any sense because bosons are indistinguishable particles. Okay, very good. Um, the whole idea is that for, you want to find the combinations, the distribution of values of big n sub little n that maximize q. But there are some constraints. For example, we are assuming that there are a fixed number of particles, that the sum of the big n sub little n's has to add up to big n. If you've got five bosons, you've got five bosons. You can put them in different states, four of them in one and one in the other, or three in one and two in the other, and so on. But they still have to add up to five all the time. And the same way with the energy. If you take the number of particles in the first state times the energy of the first state, plus the number of particles in the second state times the energy of the second state, and add all those up, you've got to get a total amount of energy that's not allowed to vary. We're not allowed to create and destroy energy. We can just move it around by moving particles around. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the idea is that those two constraints, we want to maximize Q given that we have to maintain those constraints. So one way to do that is to maximize this quantity that I'm going to call capital G, which is the natural log of Q plus alpha times the difference between n and the sum of the n's plus beta times the difference between the total energy and the sum of the n's times the corresponding energies. Notice that if the constraints are satisfied, the coefficient of alpha and the coefficient of beta are going to be zero here. This is a trick that was invented by uh, fellow named Lagrange, you've probably heard of him before, but the idea is you take the derivative of g with respect to n sub little n and uh, you set that equal to zero. Then you take the derivative of g with respect to alpha and the derivative of g with respect to beta and set that equal to zero and that gives you your uh, constraints and it maximizes Q. So the idea is you think of alpha and beta as kind of variables in a space where uh, the n sub little n's can vary and the alpha and the beta can vary but the derivative with respect to G, the derivative of G with respect to alpha, beta, and n sub n all have to be zero. So that produces some equations that you can solve if you do solve those, you get these three results that uh, big N sub little n is equal to this first expression for distinguishable, to this next expression for fermions, and to this last expression for bosons. If you divide N sub n by the degeneracy of each corresponding level, you get what's called an occupation probability or an occupation number. The expected occupation number of a particular level is how much each degenerate state, how many particles each degenerate state is expected to have, and uh, it's called its occupancy, okay? And uh, so what are the Lagrange multipliers? Well, alpha is, turns out to be basically a normalization constant. It's related to something called the chemical potential. So, um, <coughs> and beta, turns out to be it's related to the energy and it's also uh, called or related to the temperature. So if we redefine the chemical potential to be minus alpha times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature and we define the temperature to be one over the Boltzmann constant times beta, then we can plug all that stuff back in and we get the occupation number for the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, for the Fermi-Dirac distribution, and for the Bose-Einstein distribution. And the mu in this guy is now the chemical potential. It was basically put in there instead of alpha. So that's the idea. And these are the guys you'd use to go and calculate things like uh, the uh, expectation value of the energy of a particle, or the pressure, or the compressibility of a material, and based on uh, the distribution of, of energies and so on. So we'll do that in class today. We're going to use the Fermi-Dirac version to estimate the compressibility of uh, a metal at room temperature, say. And the occupancy of the Bose-Einstein distribution we can use to estimate the heat capacity of a material at room temperature. Now, what I want to show you now is a couple of demos I've cooked up that illustrate how these distributions can come about as a result of a Monte Carlo procedure called the Demon algorithm. So 
uh, I'll describe the daemon algorithm here and you can see how it works. Okay, here's a little example of the uh, Bose-Einstein. This is a graph. The X is the energy. Uh, y is the occupation number, basically. And uh, what you have here is the comparison between the Bose-Einstein distribution, uh, which I, I'm showing here for alpha equals zero, which means that this thing, uh, if you plug in X equals zero, then you get uh, one minus one. This thing blows up. So it's super exponential for small values of energy. Um, on the other hand, the Fermi-Dirac distribution is just a plain old exponential. It falls off nicely. I'm sorry, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, the classical distinguishable particle distribution, is uh, just a simple exponential. And then the Fermi-Dirac distribution is this one. It starts at one at low energies, and then it drops to about a half at uh, when... Um, the energy is equal to the Fermi energy, and then it drops off. Notice that at high energies, all these guys approach one another. So if the energy is much greater than the temperature, they all basically look exponential. What that means is you can ignore this one down here in the, in the denominator, and they all look just like the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. You can ignore this one for high energy in the Einstein Bose-Einstein distribution, and you get uh, and you get the simple Maxwell-Boltzmann deal. But at low energies, the Bose-Einstein is super exponential. The Fermi-Dirac is sub-exponential, and the exponential one is the classical distinguishable particle version. Now, I cooked up some demos here that uh, illustrate how that comes about in a kind of a Monte Carlo way. So I want to see if I can go back here and uh, let's look. Let's start with the distinguishable case. I, it's called the Demon algorithm. Actually, maybe I should uh, show it to you. Let me just pop it open here. So the Demon algorithm, you basically uh, iterate, pick a random particle or state, and then randomly bump a particle up or down in energy. And there's this demon. Whenever you take energy out of the system, you give it to the demon. Whenever you want to put energy into the system, you get it from the demon. Now, if the demon doesn't have enough energy, you can't do it. Um, and if the particle doesn't have any energy, if the particle is not in a state that allows you to take energy out, you can't do it. So n sub m here is the number of particles in the empty state, or the st and uh, and e sub d is the energy of the demon. So you just sort of iterate that process over and over again. And what the demon does is it sort of gives you the effect of the particles exchanging energy with one another. Even though you don't have any explicit mechanism for that to happen, you assume there is some mechanism for that to happen. But other than that, you're just in insisting on the rules of quantum mechanics that you count states as boson states or fermion states or distinguishable particle states, and you see what happens. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and run this for the case of the distinguishable particles. And what you're seeing here is uh, the number of particles in the lowest energy state, the next energy state, the next energy state, and so on. And you'll notice that uh, because I'm just randomly moving energy around, what's happening is the system is naturally evolving to the states that are the most likely, the distribution of, of energies that's most likely. And you can see that it evolves toward a very nice um, exponential looking distribution. So that's, uh, that's the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. If you do the same thing with, uh, with bosons, you get a similar kind of behavior, uh, except that the distribution ends up being somewhat super exponential. Now I haven't done a fit or anything to prove that, and maybe I can get that done before uh, before the next class, but I, I think you can kind of see that this is going up faster than a, this exponential curve would suggest it would hit over here somewhere, but it's actually going up faster than that. And that's a typical behavior in the Bose-Einstein case. And it's all about what we call a state and uh, how you count that. So that gives you an idea for the Bose-Einstein state. The Fermi-Dirac situation is uh, much more dramatic. So we'll look at that. You'll notice that uh, here the occupation number is one for low energies, and then it drops off to zero for high energies. And there's a sort of a narrow range in the middle where the occupation number falls. And the Fermi energy is 
right here in the middle, uh, where the occupation number goes through one half. Um, the only difference between this and the Bose-Einstein case is that uh, states are never allowed to have more than one particle in them, and uh, and that's basically it. So in the Bose-Einstein case, of course, states can have as many particles as they like. So that's the idea. And uh, let's see, was there anything else? Uh, I think that's all I have time for today, so we'll see you in class, and we'll do some of those board work calculations I told you about. Okay, finally, in class today, you'll, uh, you'll actually do on the board. I'll give you some hints and get you started, but uh, I want you to be able to calculate the compressibility of a metal and the heat capacity of a solid material. And that's the idea. We'll talk to you soon.